home. We're doing great here at church. We miss you. Hopefully we'll see you soon. I wanted to let you know that we do have a family movie night coming up again, and that is going to be January 23rd, and we're going to send out information about that soon. So we hope to see you then. Um, and today we have a really special lesson. It's from the Gospel of Paul, and we're going to be talking about what Paul tells us to do in order to get into heaven. And it's actually kind of hard but easy to do. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but Paul is telling us that we need to confess with our mouths that Jesus is the Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Um, wow, that's a lot of words and some really tough ones too. Jen, did, did you need me for something? Yes, I need your help. What do you need my help with? Okay, so I'm working on this for uh, chapel. I need to learn Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That is so funny. That's exactly what I'm telling the kids about cool. today. Cool, cool, because oh. I really need some help. This one's hard. It is hard, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, all right, so the first thing I thought maybe I was going to tell the kids and maybe I could share with you is we could talk about what confess means and what believe means. But I wonder, actually, I wonder if we should read the Bible verse first so they even know why we would want to know what those mean, right? Let's start okay. there. All right, so the, um, you guys remember our Bible, and this is what it says in the, what Paul says. Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and in your heart you have faith that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trusting with the heart leads to righteousness, and confessing with the mouth leads to salvation. The scripture says, all who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek because the Lord is the same Lord of all. And he gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. Wow, that's big stuff. This is a hard one. <laughs> it's really hard. So you only have to learn the first part. The first part is nine. Okay, it is because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and in your heart you have faith that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, what does it mean to confess? Well, it could mean if you did something bad, and then you tell somebody that you did something bad, and then you say you're sorry, you're confessing. Yes. Have you done anything bad lately? I hope not. <laughs> not on purpose? Not on purpose. Okay. But I've definitely had to confess before. I will admit that. Okay. <laughs> so, but when, when Paul is talking about confess in this Bible verse, that's not what he means. What he means is when you confess and you say something out loud, you speak it out loud. So, I love God. And then I say, I love God. To everybody, I'm confessing it. I'm saying it out loud. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, the other word that's really kind of tough is believe. Hmm. So, and you have to believe with your heart. So, to believe would mean that you know something is true. Okay. Okay. So, if I have a ball, oh, you know what? If I have a pen and I'm going to drop it to the ground, what do you, if I let go, what do you think it'll happen? It's going to fall. It's going to fall. Okay. Ooh, what happened? It fell. It fell. So you believed it was going to fall, mm -hmm. and it fell. And it fell. So it came true. That's a belief, right? So, but Paul's telling us we have to believe with our heart, right? Okay. Not just with our mind. Because sometimes we can say we believe something, but we don't really believe it, right? And our heart is a special place filled with love and trust. And so if we believe in our heart, that means it's sacred and good and really meaningful and coming from a place of love. Okay. Good? All right. All right. So, okay. How about this? Well, go ahead and get started. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to okay. see if you can remember right. it. Right. Let's see. Okay. Here it goes. All right. Okay. If you confess with your mouth, God will raise you from the dead? Huh. Well, you got part of it, but okay. not all of it. So it's... If you confess with your mouth what then, you did wrong, what you did wrong, uh huh. Hmm. No, not what you did wrong. Remember, I told you there was a difference between confessing what you did wrong and confessing by saying something out loud. So what I mean is, um, the scripture says you should confess with your mouth, your heart. No, 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 not your heart. Your heart is where you should believe. So. 
Um, you confess that Jesus is Lord, mm -hmm. and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Let's try again. Okay, okay. here it goes. If you confess with your heart and believe with your mouth, you will be resurrected. Hmm. Well, you don't confess with your heart. You believe with your heart. Okay, believe with your you heart. You confess with your mouth. Confess with your mouth. Confess means to say or speak it out loud. So you speak out what you believe in your heart. Okay, I, I get it. Okay. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Yes, 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 okay. yes. Now, you got it. So now all you have to do is add what it is that you're confessing and, and what you believe, and then you've got it. Okay. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> wait, don't tell me. Okay. Okay, okay. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You've got it! I Did you guess. guys get it at home? Let's see if we can say it one more time. What now do you think? Sense. Okay, all right, let's try all again. Right. Okay. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amazing! That makes sense. But you know what's really great about it? Remember when I read the whole passage, it said everyone who believes and confesses will be saved. Everyone, no matter if you actually had to confess that you did something wrong or you don't. No matter if you're big, no matter if you're little, no matter <laughs> if you are a fast runner or a slow walker, all you have to do is confess it and believe it.
A man Giles is in the house. Hey, buddy, you want? Could you help me do something? You up for it? I'm gonna put my mask back on. I like you to light the candle today. Would you do that for me? I mean, I put you on the spot in front of millions of people. <laughs> Come on up here. So I'm gonna have you grab that and go ahead and light from this candle. Just hang out here with me for a second. So if you're at home and you have your Christ candle with you, we want to re remind us we light this candle to remind us that the light shines in the dark and the dark does not and cannot overcome it. Amen. Thank you. It is good to see you this morning and glad that we can come together in the name of Christ and, and, uh, and share in His presence, encourage one another, and grow in the faith. Uh, this morning, um, we do have uh, a few announcements that we wanted to, to let you know about things that are happening in the life of the church and, and uh, uh, in just ways that the church has been, uh, that you, the church, have been uh, a light in other people's lives uh, uh, recently. Um, one thing we wanted to, uh, to let you know is that, um, well, Rachel wanted to let us know that we have a new Disciple Bible Study series starting soon, Disciple Bible Study 2. If you've completed Disciple Bible Study 1, um, Disciple Bible Study 2 begins this Wednesday, January 20th at 10 a.m. by way of Zoom. Um, it's a 32-week in-depth study which will focus on the Old Testament books, Genesis and Exodus, and two New Testament books, Luke and Acts. The um, and so uh, if you're interested in that, call Rachel and uh, to register and to get information uh, more about uh, the curriculum. Uh, we do, there are several things our youth ministries are, are picking up, and uh, we do want you to be in prayer for um, our upward basketball and how we're doing that differently in the, in the pandemic. And um, also to remind you to uh, uh, make sure you're wearing your mask in the community as the, the, neighbor, uh, the numbers are up and, and be careful while we're here that we keep those on the whole, whole services to protect one another. And uh, also, um, I just wanted to let you know to, to be in, in, uh, um, in prayer for different families. If you have prayer requests, to, to go ahead and submit those and, and we'll get as many of those written down as we can so we can share those later on in the service. Um, we would like to invite you now to stand with us as we pray. And I'll guide you through a prayer. Uh, we extend our hands here. It's not an act of magic or, or summoning, but it's a way for us to be physically present with God, to invite His presence into our lives and become aware that God is all, always here. And so I'll guide you through a prayer. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here. Help us to be aware of you, to be moved by you, challenged by you. Help us to see you in one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to worship, a time to praise, a time to experience God. And nothing helps us do that better than when we hear those wonderful words over and over again. Number 600 in our hymnal is Wonderful Words of Life. <laughs>
standing for our affirmation of faith, that time when we answer the question, Christian, what do you believe? And this morning it comes from Romans, where we were asked numerous questions in here with an emphatic response. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we ask the question each week, God, who are you calling me to be? Where are you calling me to go? And what are you calling me to give? And there are different ways that our church opens itself up to ministry. And I wanted to share um, a couple of those ways this morning. Uh, One is that, and this is a a family we'd like you to be in prayer for. Um, I don't know if you remember the the fantasies, um, but Michelle uh, uh, Vaughn and her family could use prayers right now as her 17-year-old son, Grant Fennessy, who had bone cancer, um, passed away last week. And we had the funeral for them yesterday. And I want to thank you for being able to have a place that we could open up, that we've been safe in our our social distancing and be able to create a a room in here in which we could provide them a space uh, for that to to mourn and grieve and tell stories and find assurances in Jesus Christ. So uh, um, thank you for uh, being that church, a place that is open to that that ministry to those in need. We also uh, have several small groups that have done uh, different uh, challenges during our stewardship campaign, we put out the challenge of uh, of these three questions, and one of the the challenges um, was there to what are you doing with your faith in your community? It's the same question we ask: um, How are you blessing people? At the, when we say this at the end of the service, and uh, we actually had a write up in the town cr- uh, crier uh, recently, uh, and. Um, to some of our responses to that, and it talked about that some of our groups had Thanksgiving uh, dinners, and they donated money to purchase food cards for those in need, and partnered with charitable organizations to provide Christmas gifts for children. And one of the uh, other groups that was highlighted was um, John and Kathy Sienna and Tom Patry and Ann Lewis had. Um, they wanted to recognize the local Palm. Uh, Beach County Fire Rescue Fighters at Wellington Fire Station, numbers 30, 27, 25, and 20. And they went to each one of these, and each fire station was um, uh, visited and presented with certificates of appreciation, uh, home-baked cookies, and a Bible for their station. And so we just want to acknowledge that there's so many different ways that you can um, be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. And uh, such a simple but uh, meaningful um, way of doing that, and, and so we want to thank uh, thank you all. I knew y'all switched seats on me, <laughs> um, and uh, um, for your ministry there, and the many other ways that our small groups are doing that. And you don't have to be in a small group to do this. I would love for you to be in a small group, but uh, um, but to find out what are some simple ways that we can be the hands and feet in this time to bring encouragement and life to those around us. Put your faith into practice. And so uh, um, we continue on in, in our worship, and one of the ways we do that is through our, our tithes and offering, and there are many different ways that we can offer ourselves up to God and, and, and service and practice and creating a space like this. It, um, uh, money is necessary for that. Uh, but what we're doing is we're giving our resources to God and, and to one another. We're bringing ourselves in as, as the body of Christ. If you're in here, our offering boxes are on the wall in the back. And uh, at home, you can, um, you can uh, mail in a, a check to the address that's provided there. You can go to our website and give that way, as well as our, um, you can text to give or through Venmo. And uh, I think there's one other. Um, you can just drive by Throw Money at us if you see uh, Debbie on the street. And, um, but uh, yeah, PayPal and, and Venmo. But we, uh, we want to offer ourselves to God and uh, in whatever way we can, that we are the body of Christ, and this is your church, and, and we're creating a space here in which we can do ministry in. Um, at this uh, 
time, we just encourage you to spend this moment in prayer. This morning's prayer song, we're going to turn to one of those good African-American spirituals. The spirituals were originally oral tradition imparted that imparted Christian values. And these workday songs were meant to drive home the point that they were indeed hurt and they were tired. The old time spiritual do Lord, the composer is typically noted as unknown. However, it's been actually credited to Julia Ward Howe, who also authored the Battle Hymn of the Republic. You might see in, in the hymnal, if you're looking there in 1986, that William Smith made an ad adaptation. Regardless, all the lyrics were of a very pleading hope, like swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Do Lord had some numerous verses involved. When I'm in trouble, do remember me. When I'm dying, do remember me. When this world's on fire, do remember me. Now, over the years, the song found its way into many, many different settings, even by Johnny Cash, who added the closing phrase of way beyond the blue. As a campfire song, which is where a lot of us probably learned this tune, there were many, many different versions, depending on where you lived, where you were, what the setting was. And uh, added an extra word in there, do you remember me? Almost asking the Lord the question rather than pleading, Lord, please remember me. Well, today we're going to bring it all together. I invite you to please stand follow the words on the screen and enjoy and sing praise and say, Lord, please remember me. When you make one of the best things about working in a church is that when you make a request for a song, people sing it. Thank you. Thank you. I know Lori enjoyed it as much as I did. Well, good morning, everyone. We have some prayers to share. And first off, we'd like to start with Billy, and she would like prayers for the Caldwells, the Brits, and the Schraders. And happy birthday to Barbara Philippi. 
I saw that on Facebook this morning. I hope you're going to have a very special day. And we need some prayers for Charlene Morgan, who uh, has COVID. Lexi Thornton has just been diagnosed with scoliosis, and she's trying to learn about all the treatments that are open for her, and it's probably a very scary time for a young lady. We need to pray for Robert Sandin's son, son's fiance, Bonnie, who was airlifted to the hospital on Wednesday after suffering a major stroke. And Marilyn, Debbie Lauda's sister, will be having surgery soon, so we need to pray for her. Continued prayers for Sabrina Barrez, Jamie Osteen, John Huffman, and Lisa Garcia, who are all battling cancer. And Linda Jones asked us to pray for John Jones, who was just signed up for hospice this past week. Marcel Burke has prayers of thanks for the unconditional love of family and friends. And Jennifer Klinkowitz, and I'm going to echo her sentiments, would like to offer tremendous praise for the coaches and volunteers of Upward, a basketball and cheer. We're extremely fortunate to live in a community of amazing people. We had a great day yesterday. Everyone kept their masks on. We felt like Ghostbusters with those little machines sanitizing everything, carrying them around on our backs. Um, but it was a great day. Prayers for Cheryl Beach's brother, Tony, who is fighting lung cancer and bone marrow cancer. Prayers for Cindy Johnson, who had shoulder replacement surgery this past week and will be going to rehab to recuperate. And we need to continue to pray for Natalie, the, pre the uh, niece of the Picknells. Continued prayers for Mary Moore, who had surgery two weeks ago, and for Sarah Rose, who began chemo again. And her first treatment was rather bumpy, so we're praying that it, it smooths out a little bit for her. Will you all pray with me? O oh Lord, God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O oh Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. With simplicity of heart, we open ourselves up to you. On this day and every day, we are, allow ourselves to be gathered in your open arms that willingly bear our burdens. Merciful Father, there is so much that rests uneasily in our hearts. Life can be hard, really hard at times. And right now, there are deep chasms in our hearts our lives and country. We are losing patience, losing hope, and perhaps losing faith in you and in one another, Lord, as we balance precariously between our desire to be connected with one another and to protect the public health, our desire to freely express our thoughts and yet use words that do not hurt another, our desire to do whatever we want and still be helpful and generous. We admit that our, our sin and we return to you with our whole hearts. God of joy, we give thanks for the countless ways you show us your perfect love. We give thanks for those things that have changed our lives for the better. We thank you for our friends and family and laughter. We thank you for the gift of the church and all her ministries. We thank you for the family that is born through the bond shared within our sanctuary. We are reborn in your bountiful blessings. Each of us are facing obstacles whether they be spiritual, financial, fears for our health, or, or for difficult relationships, and they may seem insurmountable. You know the anguish in every single one of our hearts, and we offer that anguish to you, our liberator. Help us to see your willingness to carry our burdens and ease our pain. Help us to see the moments of joy as reminders of who you are, and let everything we have and all we are be committed to showing your glory. Let us be reminded to live a life of those who are called apart. And may our word and our action be our testimony to one another. As we begin this week and a new chapter for our country, we pray that our longstanding institutional norms are honored, that there is a peaceful and orderly transition of power, that you will ease the burden of those who are angry, hurt, confused, or afraid. We pray for the integrity of our democracy, our leaders, our society, and we pray for the security of our nation, the continuity of government, and reconciliation. Only the sword of righteousness and the strength of your love will unite us, overcome our confusion, and guide us to work through our struggles so that we may fulfill your plans, not ours. Heal us. You are the Prince of Peace. Show us the way to be one nation under God, united 
honoring one another's liberties, and providing justice for all. We pray the prayer taught to us by your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today I'm going to be reading from Romans 10. And uh, Paul, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and Paul is talking about, he's talking to a group, and his desire in prayer, what he says for them, is that uh, they might be saved. And there's that whole idea of what does salvation mean. It's a word I think we often take it for granted. And it is uh, saving us not, uh, um, it's saving us from ourselves, it's saving us for life with God. If we think back to the beginning of creation when we walked, uh, when God walked in the cool of the day and was in perfect relationship with all of creation, and then we broke that, and then we were no longer in good relationship with each other, good relationship with creation, good relationship with God. Um, so God is saving us from the, the, uh, the self-centeredness of ourselves to be in relationship with God, which in turn we end up finding out our true self and who our heart longs for. Now, it's a whole other sermon to unpack that. I'm not doing that today. Um, but I had to say that so I can get to this next part. That Paul's desire is that we become saved, that we become whole, reconciled with God. And then there's different ideas of what people were taking to mean by that. And he was hoping to um, instruct them and explain to them what, a little bit more what that looked like. And he talked about, he goes, uh, um, he was bearing witness that many had zeal for God, but not according uh, to knowledge. And they were ignorant of righteousness of God, and they were seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. In other words, what they were doing, they were seeking to establish their own ideas of what they thought God would, was without actually having the, um, much knowledge about God. And they ended up relying on a list of, of rules and regulations and laws, and they ended up twisting that. And that's what we found time and time again throughout um, the Bible. And a lot of what Jesus was cre correcting was how the law was used. And it was end up using to keep people out, to keep people distance, and it wasn't liberating. It was end up being a burden that was stacking on people's shoulders over and over again. And so Paul says, I, I want to get to the heart of this. And it comes to faith and to belief and understanding the reality of God's presence in our life. And this is what he says. I'm going to begin in verse 8. He says, what does it say? It says, the word is near you, in your mouth. And in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. In your mouth and in your heart. It's something that we declare and it's something we experience. That God is around this great mystery of God's presence, which we do not all have figured out. I have hundreds upon hundreds of books in that office that talk about how complicated this whole thing can be. The idea of trying to learn who God is. But there's an intimacy that God brings to us that settles with us. A sense of knowing of God's spirit, Paul talks about speaking with our spirit, that we have the word of God, what we know and what we speak through scripture in our mouth and in our heart, in our, our mind and in our experience. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's kind of simple in, in that sense. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You will be saved. Again, understanding salvation is reconciliation with God, with the creator of all things, the mystery of the universe, the mystery of, of all known universe, the mystery of anything that we can possibly comprehend. We're reconciled with that. That is salvation because in that, again, we get into our heart's true desire. It goes on. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and saves. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no pre-qualifiers. You're not born into this. 
call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But here's the question that is underneath all of that. It's that idea of belief and faith. And the question of what does it mean to believe? What is belief? It's a tricky thing, the word belief. The problem with belief is understanding what it is that we actually believe. There are lots of things that we confess that we believe, but do we really believe them? <laughs> right. What does our action tell us? This is why Jesus, you know, the, the fruit will tell you the health of the tree. The belief is the word we say, but the action, the heart of it, the matter is what we do with it. What do we believe in? I can say that I believe in Jesus. We can all in here say we believe in Jesus, but the question is which Jesus do you believe in? Which Jesus do you believe in? We've seen recently how Jesus has been used for political gain. And by recently, I mean the past forever. Left and right, both will wield faith in order to manipulate believers. They'll wield faith to say, this is our side, this is our side, God is on our side. God is on our side. You don't think that when we fight in wars, the other people are praying, I know God is on my side. Which God, which Jesus, do we believe in? Recently, we saw the cross being used to manipulate. It was used in conjunction with the violence that took place in Washington, D.C. recently. The KKK has used Scripture to defend its abomination of an existence. And they will say that they were righteous in the way that they use it. Which Jesus do we believe in? What do we mean when we say that we believe? It's important. It matters. The next few weeks, we are going to look at a, one of the major um, creedal statements of our faith, the affirmation of faith, to express and, and discover what that, that means. What is it that we believe? What does it mean when we def say we believe something? Belief. It is a funny thing. I remember I was in eighth grade, and there was this kid, I don't remember his name, but we were in history class, and he was right before the um, class was about to start. I don't even, the teacher was just still getting his notes out of his briefcase, and the kid was just talking to the class or whoever would listen because most weren't, um, but I was, I was paying attention, and he said, uh, um, at least to the kid, never to the teacher, and he said, you know, what you, what you believe, almost the same sermon, it matters. If you believe hard enough, you can do it. If you believe something, you can achieve it, and then he says, I believe I can walk through that wall, and he ran across the room toward the wall. Now, when he was on the ground with a bloody nose, all we heard him say was, I didn't believe hard enough. Now we have that kind of faith. That's on the other hand. Then we have um, the, the other side, the, the skeptic. And one of my favorite examples of, of thinking about this, the skeptic is Sport and Life. I don't remember Sport and Life. He was the, uh, the drug dealer in Porgy and Bess. And he's the one that had that, uh, that song that's been in my head since the first time I heard it. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, that ain't necessarily so. Remember this? Methuselah lived 900 years, but who'd call that living when no gal will give in to no man who's 900 years? Remember that? And it stuck in my head because I should have thought of, okay, what is the skeptic? What is the question? How do we twist things and how things can get twisted? Believing a thing doesn't make it true. Believing a thing doesn't make it true, but it does form our practice. Think about this. Here's, I want to share with you a statement that I think is um, balderdash. It says perception is reality. And then they use that as an excuse for the behaviors that follow. Perception is reality. I say, no, reality is reality. Your perception of reality, if it's warped, is going to lead to warped behaviors. And we've seen that time and time. And time again. Reality is reality, but our perceptions of that reality, the things that we believe, they form our practice. The words form our direction. And our actions give form to the things that we trust in those actions. And our practice is a visible affirmation of our belief. Our practice is a visible, visible affirmation of our belief. You can say that you value family. But if you look at your calendar and family is nowhere in there, you don't value family. You can say you believe something, but your action is what you truly believe. 
In a world that says, believe what you want, but the practice of the world is believe what I say. Around every corner, someone selling you their declaration. Because if you don't know what you believe, they're going to sell you their belief. We live in a world, believe what you want, but the practice, believe what I say. These affirmations that people declare all the time are their creeds. Now, we see creeds all throughout life. A friend of mine, J.D. Waldy, wrote a book called Creed. And uh, um, in it, he just started pointing out some of these different ones. One of them talked about the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness. The Rifleman's Creed, they have a creed. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It ends with, before God, I swear this creed, my rifle and myself are the defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it until victory is America's and there is no enemy but peace. Even the game Assassin's Creed has a creed in it. Never kill innocent people. Always be discreet. Never compromise the brotherhood. You can save your life. Save money, live better, Walmart. Think different. You know what that one's from? Apple. You're in good hands with Austin. You know that one. These are all different creeds that drive motives, actions, and intentions of different companies. What is your creed? What is your belief? What drives you? Because again, if you do not know what you believe and where you're headed, other people are going to make that decision for you. Life circumstances will make that decision for you. And next thing you'll know, you'll be like that talking head song says, where is my life? Where is my beautiful life? Where is my car? Where is my house? What is your creed? Where are you going to end up? The church has been a creedal faith from its inception and actually beyond. Genesis is less a book about how the world was made. The Hebrews weren't interested in giving you a description of this is how it was made. Here's a scientific explanation for how it was made. But to explain who made the world. It was a creedal statement in that. If you look at the poetry of First and Second Genesis, it is um, a poem and a song about God made the world. This is who God is. This is humanity is. This is who we're called to be. The priests were making a declaration, this is our God, by saying, in the beginning, God. And then we get a picture of who this God is. Who do we believe? That creed was simplified in what we know as the, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Shema simply is Hebrew for hear, O. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It is foundational in our own creedal statement. The first Christian creed, you know what this is? The first Christian creed is, Jesus is Lord. It's our first creedal statement. You look through Scripture, it's the first creedal statement is, Jesus is Lord. You think about it and unpack that, what you're saying. It says a lot. The question is, does your belief flow out of that, that Jesus is Lord? These are the core statements of the faith that are to form how it is that we leave. As time moved on after the resurrection of Jesus, different people were coming into the Christian communities and they began changing and challenging some of the teachings. And so councils were formed to sort of express this and the teachings of Scripture they came up with with creedal statements. That's why you have the Council of Nicaea and the Apostles' Creed. And I'll get to that one in just a second. But these creedal statements, they were being taught to all new believers in what is called a catechism. Now, I know a few of you are former Catholics, and you thought I became Methodist so I could get away from some of the formality. Um, but let's face it, that Methodists are what happened when Baptists dress up for Halloween. And so you're going to get a little bit of that. And we are basically Catholics. We are the... <laughs> When Catholics marry Baptists, this is where the compromise. This, this, I bet you there's a lot of you in here <laughs> that that's happened too. And so there is this idea still of liturgy and, and liturgy, liturgy and catechism in them. And so don't glaze over. I want you to come back because this is important. And the reason I've talked talking about this is because of all the events that have happened so 
much in our lives over the past years, we need a reminder of who it is that we are. To remember that we're not being formed by the world, we don't are not formed by the anxieties of the world, but something far deeper and more ancient, primal, and in the beginning, God. So the word catechism shares its root with echo. So basically, it means it's an echo of the faith throughout time. And ultimately, if we go back far enough, we're an echo of the face of God, that God's desire is that we reflect God, that we become echoes of God's word, God's light, God's love. Jesus says, as you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he wants that reflection for us as well. That echo. Faith that does not deviate because it is in a God who does not change. Now that doesn't mean that we don't explore and understand our faith differently. It doesn't grow and change. But the elements of the God we believe in does not. So we explore. We go deep in that life. The world is in constant change and flux. And sometimes if we're not sure where we plant our feet, would it be the same today or tomorrow? You think about all the changes. Just think about the technology changes that have happened in the past 20 years. It's insane, right? Anybody just got stressed out just trying to keep up with it? Oh, just me. Okay. I know that's a lie because I know many of you are like my parents, and that's the stress just explaining what Zoom or FaceTime or Facebook is. Sorry, Dad. It's stressful. But we can rely on a God who remains the same, a God who says he's there in the beginning to call us to himself, to be in relationship with himself, to bring about love. For God so loved the world. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I even want to step bigger. Love one another as I have loved you. The main creed of the Christian church is the Apostles' Creed. And it's called this because there are 12 statements of belief for the 12 apostles. Now, legend has it that each apostle contributed one of these lines. It's just a legend. I don't know if there's any validity to it, but it's a fun thought. But the Apostles' Creed, 12 statements, and you've seen this before. Julie, I know I didn't ask you this ahead of time, but if you have the Apostles' Creed up there, if you throw that up there, and I'm going to walk us through, but it begins with, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And then we say, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. These are the 12 statements in our faith that we say that we believe, and unpacking that really forms the basis for what it is, how we live our life. The songwriter Rich Mullins had a song called The Creed, and in the chorus said, I believe what I believe, it makes me who I am. I did not make it, but it is making me. It is the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. This is no mere mental exercise. This isn't about right words. It's not even about doctrine. But it is about heart pumping hands in the dirt, living in the soil of life. It's an ancient phrase that many say and have memorized and have for several thousand years. But we are nothing if we only cling to the words of it. If it becomes something rote that we just say each Sunday. We are people who believe in something more. People who cling to a belief that forms our action. And a belief that begins with, I believe in God. I believe in God. That right there separates you from many. It changes you. And not that we want to be separate, but it can make a declarative statement about who it is that you want to be. Already when you state that I believe in God, that you are believing in a power of something unseen. You are believing that there is more than what we can experience right here. When you say, I believe in God, 
And it is the very admission of saying you believe in God, you are saying you believe there is another world at work in the midst of this world. It is a world we do not comprehend, but it is a mystery that we enter. One in which we experience a phenomenon that makes us call out, sometimes without explanation, my God, you are there. It's a longing in us to say, I believe in this God. My Lord, my God, how majestic is your name. Look at the Psalms. It's that of exclaiming that, oh, there is something big here. Psalm 100, we say, God, you made us and we are yours, that we belong to this mysterious, this mysterious love. We call out. And somehow, we get to experience God's revelation in our life, the love of others, through nature, through unexplained phenomenons. So we begin to see that there is something more than what's happening right here. And that should lead us with confidence as we move into the things that we do see that we go, this is awful. This is painful. But we move with hope that God is redeeming and making all things new. We believe in a God who we call out to when we are beaten down and lost and confused and hurt. We call out to this God with hope and expectation that he will make all things new. That this is not all that there is. That there is life to be had. When we make our statement, we believe in God, we begin to think it is possible that we can live differently in response to the chaos and the crises of the world. What you believe matters. And thinking matters. And thinking about what you believe matters. Because it is what makes you who you are. It's what forms you. It's what sets your course, defines your hope, and ignites your action. My prayer is just like Paul's, that we can all be saved, reconciled to God, made new and strong in his love, in his image, and not the image of brokenness, but the image of life. I hope you'll join me in the next few weeks as we explore the beauty of this belief. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we place our hope and trust in you, that you are making all things new. We believe in you. And as astounding and astonishing and uh, an amazing a statement it is to say we believe in you when we can't see you, and we know that it's profound, God, we love you. And we want to experience you. So forgive us of our sins. Open us up for the freedom of your life that we might be reconciled to you and to one another in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you'll enjoy me as we sing um, our closing song from our, our worship band, uh, The Lion and the Lamb.
Well, as you go out this week, I encourage you to remember bells, and for those who are new to that, that's uh, to bless, to remember to bless, that B is to go and bless uh, three people this week, at least one person outside of your faith community, um, to bless them. And to uh, the E is to eat with someone I know in COVID times that changes. So it's to find time when you can have dialogue with, with someone and, uh, and see how God can open up that, that opportunity to share um, faith, to share life, uh, to share encouragement with someone. To use the L is to uh, listen, spend time in prayer listening to Jesus. The other L is to learn Jesus. If you want to know what you believe, you've got to learn who Jesus is. And then the S is to remember you're sent in this world. So go be a light. Share the love of Christ with everyone you meet. Amen.